We'll now be moving on to the group that is presenting on maps, dashboards, and how we will use them to plan, deliver, and evaluate SNAP-Ed programs, a panel discussion. Thanks, Dawn. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Basselt from Altarum, and my colleagues and I are here to share some information about maps and dashboards. Next slide, please. We have a panel of presenters from three different states, and I'll have my colleagues introduce themselves when they each share their state's map or dashboard. Next slide. And at a high level, we'll be talking about how we use these maps and dashboards to support SNAP-Ed, discuss who the end users are for these resources, and share a bit about the training and onboarding we're currently using or have planned to support users. Next slide. Our colleague Kaylee from Iowa Department of Health and Human Services was unable to make it today, so I'll share on behalf of our collaboration about the Iowa snap -Ed Needs Assessment map. Next slide. Here we have the landing page of the Iowa snap -Ed Needs Assessment map. The overall purpose in developing this was to help inform their needs assessment, including identifying areas of need where programming is already being implemented and new opportunities for programming and partnerships. On the screen, we see a state level view that primarily focuses on a high level look at key indicators. And across the top, you'll see that we have options for deeper dives into topics such as demographic characteristics, poverty, obesity, fruit and vegetable consumption and physical activity, food insecurity and quality of life. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the types of data that we used. We pulled in some publicly available data uh, like the Iowa Burfis County Health Rankings and American Community Survey indicators. We're also able to incorporate some data sources that are more on the program administrative side, which included the locations, interventions, and focus audiences for SNAP at DE and PSE efforts. Additionally, we used Iowa HHS SNAP and WIC enrollment data. Lastly, we were able to include a variety of community indicators to begin to understand what types of resources and other programs are also happening in communities, including the number of farmers markets, SNAP and WIC authorized retailers, and other food and nutrition focused programs. Next slide. The dashboard was built in Tableau in fall of 2022 and is hosted on the Iowa HHS online server and was officially released in January 2023. It's available to all, however, it does require the sharing of a direct link for access, and the data have begun to be updated quarterly. So far, this dashboard has been used to support the Iowa snap -Ed Needs Assessment and has been shared with a variety of other programs like WIC, CDC High Obesity Program, and local county public health departments. Currently, we're working together on a version 2.0 that will include more data and filtering features to help programs evaluate state and county needs. Next slide. When we released the dashboard last year, Altarum also created several supplemental materials to go along with it. There's a user manual that provides an overview of how the dashboard is set up and how to navigate its functionality. You can see a few examples from that user guide on the screen. There are screenshots and notes that explain each indicator. And the data source guide was also created to provide detail about the data sources and how the data was used or calculated for the visualizations. Iowa HHS snap -Ed staff provide both of these resources to partners when sharing the dashboard link, and I've also held numerous partner meetings to give live tutorials on how to use the dashboard to make informed decisions. Next slide. And here, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from Minnesota, Linjin. Uh, next slide, please. Yep, hello. This is, uh, my name is Hyunjun Kim from Minnesota. Uh, I'd like to introduce the snap -Ed Big Map that we have been using for more than seven years now. And it was developed by a graduate research assistant uh, seven years ago, who was me, and I'm still working on this. <laughs> um, so this is a snapshot of the Big Map. As a result, uh, as a default, it shows the partner sites from fiscal year 2015 to 2022. Currently, we are updating this using 2023 data, but not yet released. 
Uh, you can see we are working with a lot of partners across the state. The ultimate goal of having the big map is twofold. The first, we would like to show our impact to our stakeholders and our funders. How many, how diverse, how geographically wide we work with the communities in Minnesota. Secondly, we use Big Map to do programming based on the assets and needs of communities. We can identify community assets like community champion partners, food pantries, and schools. Also, we can identify community needs based on the secondary data, including population characteristics and community health outcome data. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have um, many different layers, more than 50 layers. That is why we call it Big Map. It includes programming location data by drag education curriculum, PSC projects and partner locations, and SNAP and educators lo office locations. It has basic demographics data, including race, ethnicity, age, income, and poverty, including SNAP and eligibility. Also, it has tribal nations locations. It also has environmental scan data like food access facilities, physical activity facilities, nature engagement facilities, mental health facilities, education and child care facilities, and transportation. It also includes other social de determinants of health data like education and, education and employment, internet access, social vulnerability index, and health insurance data. Next slide, please. Uh, we use ArcGIS on GIS online platform, which is free for the University of Minnesota staff. We specifically use Experience Builder for more comprehensive features. Next slide, please. All right, we provide wide varieties of training, including trainings, trainings for leadership, SNAP ad educators and new staff members. We also have a video recorded training for self based learning, and we have a story map for introduction of Big Map. I am also part of ASNA GIS subcommittee under the evaluation committee. We share um, our experience and resources with each other. Now I will hand it over to Caitlin. Hi, everybody. I'm Caitlin Kanaki. I'm a senior program lead for evaluation for Illinois snap -in. Um, I'm going to share with you the community de dashboard that we have been working towards um, over the last seven years or so as well. Next slide. So my section is going to focus a little bit more on how our, t our tool has evolved over time. Um, we started mapping and dashboarding in 2017, um, and at that time, we've used a variety of different softwares, including uh, Tableau and um, RStudio. Um, and the tools that we have always ended up with were heavily based on the stakeholders that were going to be using them and what they needed. Um, our initial version in Tableau was primarily focused on um, users at more of our state level planning, um, kind of more of our ad uh, admin portion of our grant. Our second version was developed in our studio. The user audience for that, we tried to widen um, quite a bit to include our state level admin, but also our field teams and staff implementing the program across the state. Um, I also am part of the GIS um, subgroup with Hengen, and when I joined that group, um, I was really interested in how others were um, creating their dashboards, and uh, we were due for an update to ours, and so we started collaborating with Hengen um, because we really liked how they were working on uh, the version that they had created. And because we're also part of the university system, had access to the same the licenses for the same platform. So the tool that's currently displayed right now is the version of our dashboard that we are in the middle of releasing for our staff. Um, and it is actually built from the base of Hingen's map. 
Um, we, my, the staff on my team who, um, who has been building this has a background in um, GIS and also urban planning. Um, and that individual has been coordinating with um, context on Hinge's team to learn about um, how they built their map and how we can pull some of their information forward to, um, to speed up the process of getting our tool out to our staff. So the current version you read from left to right um, we, for in our state, because we have very, very urban areas and very rural areas, um, having different geographic definitions is very important for our staff. This version of the map, um, the primary user audience is our PSE staff um, and also our regional and state level, um, state level admin. So you can see many of our data sources are the same as engines because we pulled those forward. Thank you to his team for doing that work. Um, we pulled those forward and we made modifications based off of an advisory team of field staff who basically helped us, uh, told us exactly what they wanted and how they wanted to see it. Um, so our, uh, the build, the person on my team who's been building it, we built an initial version um, we took it to an advisory group of staff. They told us what they liked and what they didn't like, and it's been an iterative process, um, and we're still making adjustments based on feedback we received. Next slide, please. So one of the uh, most important things is our staff wanted to be able to see things at a very high level, and they wanted to be able to zoom in to a very low level as well. So you can see what the map looks like when you add a few more layers in here. Um, this is showing you what it looks like with our with programming sites added, with layers about eligibility added. You can click on a site and it shows you additional information about what's happening at that site. You can add geographic um, boundaries so that you can visually see where um, communities, counties, census tracts, and all of that begin and end. Next slide, please. Um, so types of data, I talked about that. We have programming, we have community resource data so that staff can plan effectively for, um, we have our PSC staff does a lot of community level intervention. Um, and so they do a lot with coalitions and grant writing, helping for all of that. So this is all very important. Secondary data, census data, and then the geographic boundaries is important. Next slide, please. Um, so I talked a little bit about this already. Our platform, we're working from ArcGIS now as well. We built from um, Hingen's tool, so that's kind of a benefit of collaborating and working with others. Um, we are adopting a super user system in our state. This comes from my days working in hospital systems, um, where our, we've identified field staff across the state who um, we've kind of done over over training. Um, and they are then kind of the go-to people within the state that field staff can go to. We give ongoing training for onboarding. Um, we are in the midst of creating a short video tutorial. Um, and then our super user field staff um, are gonna be hosting an in-depth workshop um, at a state conference that we have coming up where they're gonna be taking examples of their own work um, and demonstrating how they use the tool to um, support their efforts. Next slide. I think that takes us to our questions. Thank you for a great presentation. We do have quite a few questions that are in the chat so far. Um, the first one is we will, of course, share the slides in uh, on the ASNA website, but are you able to share the links to the visualizations that you're sharing today? Um, some of our, I have to double check. Yes, I believe um, from Illinois we can. Um, we do have some agreements for data. Um, some of our stuff is internal only. So I ne just need to verify that um, what we have on there right now for internal use um, is allowable for sharing. Um, I can share our link. It's publicly available. So um, I answered it, but it, as I typed answer, it just disappeared. Um, it's z.umn.edu slash snapbed big map. I think it's quite easy enough. I will also add it into the chat. 
for everyone as well. And I just replied in the Q&A box, I'll follow up with Haley and the Iowa team to confirm on shareability. Uh, our next question is, I think maps and dashboards are great, but one thing I've been thinking about lately is how they have changed the way we do programming. Is there any data or studies available on that? Any other presenters? I I have not uh, looked into that, uh, into studies on that specifically. I'm not sure if anybody else on the call on our team has. Uh, we we didn't do any research around that, but we use it for staffing. So when we see the great need in the community, but we haven't worked with that specific community, then we intentionally hire um, step ed educator or coordinator there to do more pro programming based on the big map data. That is one application of using it. And I can add to, I mean, I know um, our staff use it on a regular basis um, to identify uh, community partners in the field. Um, I had a call with a group yesterday that was telling me, you know, oh, they were really trying to figure out if a site was eligible, if they could go work with them or not. Um, I know our PSE staff have used it heavily to help coalitions write grants and get um, additional leverage um, external funding for uh, local efforts that are coming in. Um, yeah, those are probably the most uh, top of mind uses. How do we encourage implement processes so that colleagues use maps and dashboards on a regular basis versus only using them at the community needs assessment stage? I think one way that we've been talking with the Iowa team is about having regular updates to data that does change throughout the year. So those quarterly updates, I think, are keeping the data more re relevant and usable throughout the programming year, not just at the needs assessment time. For our tool, a lot of our data sources are connected to APIs on the back end. And so um, as we're sharing it with our staff, we tell them, hey, you know, when you update your program, this also helps with getting reporting done. <laughs> um, when you update your program data in pairs, the system that we use, it's gonna show on the map directly. Um, you know, we're connected into census API and all of that. So that's one way um, is people knowing that it, it current. Um, the other piece, I didn't show this here, is that we have some other features on the map where we provide links to other sources of data. We wanted to be careful that we're not just recreating tools that have already been created. Like it's, they're, it's very intentional. Um, so we try to make it like a center point for our staff where if they need information, they can come here to either see what we have or navigate to another resource. So in the upper right hand corner of our map, we actually have external links that take them to other sources of information directly. All of our um, sources are listed on a sources page so that people can see exactly where they're coming from. And then the last thing we do is we have monthly um, field team calls. And so I have a number of different updates that I give every month um, and so every month I say something about the dashboard because I don't want people to forget it's there. Okay, hey, and last question. Um, we're gonna take one more question because we are a little bit behind on time, but um, can any of the speakers say how uses of maps has changed activities in the field and different activities, greater efficiency, new partnerships. And then if you would like to respond to the other two questions uh, with typed responses, that would be great. I think I shared some examples from ours already. Um, staff looking for new partners, new areas, um, to connect with um, in the community, um, different activities, greater efficiency, new partnerships. Um, 
Yeah, they, I mean, primarily using it with their coalition work um, is a big one for field staff, for um, like at the admin level, looking at population density, eligibility density, for, you know, um, placement of resources, um, even looking at, we have demographic information built into here, in here, so looking at um, characteristics of eligible populations and what needs for those areas might be. Thank you very much. There are two additional questions, if you don't mind uh, potentially chat, chatting in those responses. We are going to go ahead and move forward to the next presentation to try to stay online or stay in the time realm of our agenda. Um, the next presentation will be focused on leveraging technology to adapt, disseminate, and implement a statewide obesity prevention program in Head Start centers. Hi, everyone, and we are Chief of Boss Team here at the Prevention Research Center, University of New Mexico. And today we're going to present our Chief of Boss program, and I will be presenting with my colleague, Victoria. Next slide, please. So the Chile uh, Plus means that Child Health Initiative for Lifelong Eating and Exercise has been a state white nutrition education and the obesity prevention program for the Head Start children across New Mexico. And it has been implemented by the UNMPRC since 2011. And the aim of the Chile Plus are that Head Start children and their families will eat more fruits and vegetables, choose whole grains and low fat dietary products and drink more water, eat few high, high fat food and uh, drink less sugar sweetened beverage. And parents should learn how to serve and uh, choose food in age appropriate portion size. And kids should spend at least 30 minutes every day engaging in moderate to vigorous physical activity and spend no more than one hour per day being sanitary. Chili Plus intervention includes nutrition and physical activity classroom curriculum for teachers to use. And Chile Plus also provide repeated opportunities to try new foods and to increase physical activity throughout the school day. And Chile Plus also provide the professional development trainings for the health store teachers, food service staff, coordinators, and administrators. Content include healthy eating, active living, and the family engagement strategies. So we now partner with more than 100 health store centers across New, Mex New Mexico. In this presentation, we're going to showcase how we have utilized technology to implement and evaluate this SNAPAT initiative. Next slide, please. The currently technology used in Chile Plus include Digital repository, well, we make Chili Plus nutrition and the physical activity curriculum, as well as family engagement and materials publicly available. The parents and teachers can go to our website to download as needed. So these materials are available in both Spanish and English languages. And we also created our own social media platforms, including X, Instagram, Facebook, while we share health education and healthy lifestyle tips with our audience, such as health star teachers and the parents of preschoolers. To adapt the COVID impact during pandemic, and we also develop an online trainings for health star teachers and staff, especially for new teachers and teachers in rural area where we cannot provide in-person trainings. Our online trainings covers the topics of health and the nutrition education, as well as how to implement our Chile Plus program. So all this technology I just covered are publicly available on our Chile Plus website. Next slide, please. I will hand it over to my colleague, Victoria. Thank you, Nan. Like Nan mentioned, we have a digital repository, which is free and open to the public and housed on our website. That includes our nutrition modules. We have eight modules 
Each module contains a fruit and a vegetable and eight lessons. Our lessons include food detectives, taste testers, and let's get cooking. We also have our physical activity curriculum there, and that has 115 lessons, 74 of which require no equipment whatsoever. They're all age appropriate and for skills and learning for Head Start children. And we also have our family engagement activities. So again, anyone can go there and download these um, specifically for the family engagement activities. Those are in English and in Spanish. And those include nutrition tips and healthy recipes. Next slide, please. So in 2020, when COVID hit and we could no longer go around and conduct in-person in trainings, we decided it was important to develop our virtual online training. And so there's a lot of great information in this training. Again, this is on our website. Um, anyone can access this. It has nutrition basics. It talks about our nutrition curriculum, our physical activity curriculum. You can see in this top slide here what we say matters. This is part of um, all of our trainings that we do. How we frame our messaging is very important. So that covers that on our virtual training. And you can see that drop and drag um, an example of how to categorize our, our healthy, healthy foods. And we had 117 teachers utilize our virtual training in 2023. Next slide, please. And this is an example of a snippet from one of our uh, nutrition lesson video demonstrations. If you could play this. So There's it's sound, Dawn. You could we turn had up. issues with sound yesterday. Oh, bummer. Anyway, I'm it's it's sure. a great it's a great snippet. And this is Mike Duran. He was our nutrition intern last year, and he helped us make these um, some wonderful um, nutrition lesson demo um, demonstration videos. So this was just a very short snippet, giving you exa an example of what we're showing. Um, next slide, please. So for evaluation, we use um, the REDCap reporting system, which is a web-based reporting system. And so we ask our Head Start teachers or anyone that's implementing Chili Plus um, to record what they're doing in the module checklist once per week. So this shows us which nutrition activities they're doing, which lessons they've done, how many children participated, um, et cetera. And it helps us also uh, maintain a count of how much structured physical activity has been done that week. This is also a great place for Head Start teachers or anyone that's implementing Chili Plus um, to comment or report back to us if they have specific concerns, questions, or just observations. So um, if none of you have been to New Mexico, I, I suggest you visit. We're known for our chili peppers. And so one of the comments we had back from the Head Starts is one of we have a lesson on bell peppers, which are totally different from New Mexico chili peppers. But when the kids went to taste the, the bell peppers, they were afraid they were going to be spicy like the chili pepper. So that was some some feedback we received back that that needs to be clarified, that bell peppers are different than New Mexico um, hatch chili peppers. And next slide, please. With that, I'll turn it back over to Nan. All right, thank you, Victoria. So our original chili nutrition curriculum introduced uh, eight fruits and eight vegetables, such as bell pepper, and pineapple, tomato, and et cetera. Each fruit and vegetables has four different activities to cover, such as food detectives, taste tasters, and let's get cooking. There are a total of four lessons per fruit, and therefore it comes a total of 64 nutrition lessons. This 64 nutrition lessons can be carried over for two years. As Head Start is a three-year program, it means that in the third year, teachers has to go back to introduce the same topic that has been covered in the first or the second year. 
To end this, we have expanded our nutrition modules by adding four more fruits and four more vegetables so that we can add extra 32 nutrition lessons to our original nutrition curriculum. So it comes to a total of 96 nutrition lessons that can be used across a three-year PASTAR program. We call this nutri uh, Chili Plus Nutrition Supplement. And we, uh, you can see the examples here that we add the beet and plum and other fruit and vegetables that are culturally and age appropriate here in New Mexico. Next slides, please. And as uh, Victoria mentioned earlier about our RACAP, we use RACAP to monitor the implementation of our Chili Plus. So the biggest challenge for us is to monitor our Chili Plus activities as a statewide dissemination. So in April last year, and the Chili Plus team conducted a focus group to understand the facilitators and the barriers of implementing our program. And many high school uh, teachers indicate that in implementing Chili Plus with printed materials is troublesome when they have a big classroom because they need to play music, take, focus, uh, take photos, and read curriculum, among other tasks at the same time. In the meantime, teachers complain about their reporting Chill Plus activity separately through the RECAP on a weekly basis is very challenging because they didn't have extra time after class, which restricted our ability to monitor the statewide dissemination Last but not least, due to limited staff, our team is not able to deliver professional development trainings and family engagement activities to all health store centers, especially in rural areas, because we're working with more than 100 health store centers here. And therefore, teachers request us to develop an app that combines all in one. So electronic tools have been gaining attractions as a way to promote healthy habits in children, including obesity prevention. Evidence suggests that children may grasp nutrition content more readily when they learn it in an interactive electronic environment. And in interactive technology interventions have been effective in promoting children's fruit and vegetable consumptions. And in some cases, electronic methods of delivering nutrition and physical activity information may be especially effective in promoting health behaviors. The White House has specifically encouraged the development of new media and technology to promote physical activity. To end this, we proposed a plan to develop our own Chill Plus apps. So early this year, we are awarded by the New Mexico Higher Education Department for the Technology Enhanced Fork. And we call this funded project is eChili, which is electronic version of Chili Plus. So this project has three aims. The first aim is to develop a mobile app that int uh, integrates the Chili Plus for intervention components and a reporting system, allowing teachers to use it um, their own electronic platform, such as cell phone or the tablet. Aim two is to evaluate the feasibility, accessibility, and appropriateness of the Chill Pulse mobile app. So the aim three is to conduct a 12 weeks pilot randomized control trial to examine the preliminary efficacy of this each Chili per project on preschoolers' physical activity and dietary behaviors. Looking ahead, we plan to expand our digital platform to function as a mobile application for devices such as tablet and the smartphones. And to address the challenges in project reporting and our future strategy involves integrating an activity tracker that automatically logs a teacher's activity as they use the app in that classroom. With that, being that the teacher, they don't have to report after the classroom as long as they use that app and they are locked in automatically so that we can better monitor this statewide dissemination. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is our presentation today and thank you so much. If you have questions.
We do. We have a couple questions in the Q&A so far. Thank you very much for your presentation. What is the cost, if any, for this curriculum, Chile? So actually, the Chile Plus curriculum is for free. So every curriculum, nutrition, physical activity, and technical materials are publicly available on our website. So for the teachers, for the parents, if you're interested, go ahead and uh, go to our site, our website, you can just download it for free. What is the incentive for Head Start teachers to be trained? How do you recruit them? We don't, we just provide the certificate and the completion of our training because many teacher, many Head Start teachers here, they are required to complete Thirteen hours of training each year. So, Chill Plus training comes as three or two or three hours of their annual training. So that can be a incentive. We don't provide the money mo uh, monetary incentive right here. For Chili Plus, I might have missed it, but has the uptake by high school teachers increased? Did it increase participation? So this is designed specifically. I'm sorry, head start, not okay. high school. <laughs> okay, sorry, I need the question again. I was just going to clarify that it's for head start age. It's not yes. high school. Yes, preschoolers. For Chili Plus, I might have missed it, but has the uptake of Head Start teachers increased and did it increase participation? The on the virtual training or I guess I'm a little I need more clarification yeah. on the question. Yeah, can I just so can you clarify, please? A little bit. Uh, yes, I would say after, but compared to COVID, before the COVID, and uh, we could several health store shut down forever here in New Mexico, but we added this year two more Pablo health store centers and uh, two more health store centers based in Albuquerque. We increased the participation a little bit by health store centers and teachers were assigned to participate in. Any mm -hmm. other questions? Okay, if there's any other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and I'm sure they'll stay on for a little bit to answer them um, via typing. Um, but we will go ahead and move on so that we can try and stay on track today and we don't take out too much of our time for the break. So we're going to move on to the next block. Thank you both so much. Great presentation. Thank you. All right. So we will move on to reaching diverse audiences. And we will hear a presentation about Africa Diaspora Dual Language Initiative, the Swahili Project. And I'll hand it over to that team. Hi, good morning. Well, well, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, so my name is Winnie uh, Mukuna. I am the uh, evaluation coordinator uh, for TSU Snap Ed. Um, and we'll, my colleague and I, Ebony, uh, will be talking about the Swahili Project, uh, which is the Africa Diaspora Dual Language Initiative. Um, and uh, we have a graphic designer, Marian, that was also a part of making um, this presentation. So next slide, please. So the vision for this um, project um, started when I met with uh, one of my friends, uh, Alice. Uh, she is a translator and an interpreter uh, for Swahili speaking uh, refugees in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and we just got talking about, I had just started my new position at TSU and she wanted to know what I do. Um, and, you know, during the talk, uh, we just, I learned what she does and I, you know, just explaining what uh, Snap Ed is. Uh, she told me she actually worked with people that I, um, would 
you know, SNAP, are SNAPED eligible. And from that, uh, so it's a SNAPED and FNEP, both of them. Um, so uh, after talking uh, and then doing a little bit of research, we found out that there were actually lots of refugees from Congo, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, Somali, uh, and they all speak Swahili. Um, and then so after the, you know, doing a little research, we said that there was actually need uh, for, you know, TSU um, uh, SNAPED and FNAP programming um, with the uh, refugees. Uh, and we actually found that there is more um, refugees, not just in Davidson County, which, you know, is Nashville, but there's also some of them in uh, Shelby County, which is Memphis, Tennessee. Next slide, please. So just so we have a rough idea of how many refugees we have, uh, as at last year, uh, end of fiscal year, last uh, 2023, there was 21,460 uh, refugees from the DRC, which is the uh, country in, highlighted in dark blue on there. Um, so the Congolese, uh, I mean the, I mean I call them the Congolese. It's the Democratic Republic of Congo. They do account for about between uh, anywhere between thirty to forty-five percent of all refugees that have were admitted last year into the United States, and about three hundred and eighty-three of them resettled were resettled in Tennessee. Um, so we kind of have um, an you know a perspective of this. The Congolese do make up the uh, large population of the refugees that we are uh, reaching out to. Um, and they do speak Swahili in Congo, but most of it is uh, uh, Francophone. They speak French. Uh, but because they have traveled, uh, you know, for before they are resettled into the United States, they um, get housed or they get um, kind of asylum in the neighboring countries. So most of these people, uh, most of the refugees, most of the Congolese do come in through Kenya and Tanzania, which are Swahili speaking. And because they stay in this uh, countries for a while before they are resettled as permanent residents, they adapt and um, you know pick up the language, pick up some of the culture, uh, all from these refugee camps. So that is why um, we have most of them speaking uh, Swahili. Um, next slide, please. So the process of this initiative, how uh, we are working uh, on it, we first asked partnered with a, a resettlement agency in Nashville uh, called uh, NICE, Nashville International Center for Empowerment. And then we translated a curriculum from English to Swahili. It, it is actually ongoing. Um, and then after we started the translation, we conducted a cultural awareness training for all our educators um, in, uh, in Tennessee for uh, TSU educators. And then we uh, last no, October, we held a focus group with the community gatekeepers. And this is the gatekeepers of the um, the gatekeepers of the uh, the immigrant or the refugees that are uh, in Nashville. And then afterwards, so we are planning to use culturally uh, relevant skill builders and class setups to attract and retain our participants. Next slide, please. So uh, just a little bit about our partner, NICE. Um, this organization was started in 2005 by refugees from South Sudan. And because of what they went through, through the resettlement, you know, just um, the whole adapting of, of different culture and, you know, there's, um, first there's a culture shock, there's language difference, there's all this new environment, there's weather and there are a lot of things going on. And they, um, some of the, a group of them came together and you know uh decided to help other uh refugees uh and this center actually advocates for uh the refugees and immigrants that come into uh through Nashville uh and help them to build strong community uh relationships as well as creating sustainable service programs and developing partnerships uh, around middle tennessee so what nice does is once the refugees come here, they enroll them into English speaking classes. Um, they help them uh, get SNAP benefits. They help, help them get WIC, whoever needs WIC. They help them get insurance and transportation and just basically um, set them up to um, 
be able to live a uh, you know a better life here so nice um through nice uh, is uh, how we are planning or how we are reaching our participants uh next uh slide please um so we did um start with a curriculum translation uh, and we uh, we translated the North Carolina's families eating smart and moving more, and this is because it's one of our most widely used curriculums uh, for uh, TSU uh, CNAP. Um, and then so we translated just the handouts and the recipes because uh, whoever will be teaching uh, will be um, uh, uh, bilingual. So we did not need to translate uh, um, the edu educators' copy, and then. So now, so far, uh, we are done uh, with the translation. Uh, it's just editing and putting everything uh, together uh, for this, uh, for the North Carolina uh, Families Eating Smart Moving More. Next slide, please. Um, so we are also translating A Taste of African Heritage, which is an old ways, old ways heritage cooking curriculum. Um, so this work will begin uh, probably um, uh, mid-June uh, in the fiscal year, uh, and it might take a while to complete. Uh, as well, we are uh, just doing the recipes and the um, uh, just the recipe and the handouts. So basically why we chose a taste of African heritage is because uh, TSU um, reaches out to not just um, the refugees are not the only people that will benefit from this, but it will also be a conversation starter with, um, you know, the um, uh, African-American community in Nashville and, you know, Memphis and about, you know, what their uh, heritage is, uh, what they ate, what they what their foods um, look like. Uh, and then this will kind of bring together the refugees and the you know, and the African American community to just uh, come together and basically talk about food and prepare it, and you know, basically uh, have it as a conversation starter. Uh, next slide, please. And I will have Ebony uh, take up the cultural awareness training. Ebony, I don't know if she's logged in. I see her and it looks like she's unmuted, but Ebony, we can't hear you. Oh, um, she is trying to log in. Okay, I'll just continue. Um, so uh we did the cultural awareness training. Um, so we had uh the translator come in, uh Alice, because she also um basically has a wealth of knowledge about you know the culture and um traditions of the refugees. Uh so we um she talked and you know discussed about how to interact uh with the refugees, you know, the appropriate ways of doing it. And then we also had um uh, a demonstration of how interpretation works because um mostly um you know uh, some of the educators actually most of the all of them none of them has uh, worked with the interpreter before so we just had uh, you know just like a demonstration so what at what point do you speak or how do you do it uh, you know eye contact and everything so uh, we did have the uh, a demonstration for that and then we also uh uh Talk about uh, how to build strong relationship and working both efficiently and respectfully with this new audience. Our next slide, please. Um, so apart from that, on the training, we invited the partners from NICE so that they can give us an insight on how they work with refugees, uh, just to let us know, you know, you know, kind of protocols on how they uh, uh you know, how they conduct their business and how they relate to them. Um, we also had trusted messengers who are basically the community gatekeepers or ambassadors. Uh, they're refugees, uh, you know, been through the whole process. So they shared their experiences uh, with us as refugees, how the resettlement uh, process was, you know, how, how, um, how they moved actually from, uh, you know, 
the DRC and to their host country before they were resettled into the United States and how the whole transition from Africa and, you know, being here and, you know, what kind of uh, challenges they faced in the new country, what kind of, uh, you know, what was different and stuff like that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, after we did that last year in October, we conducted a focus group at one of the churches that, uh, you know, the, some of the refugees um, attend. Um, and we had about 20 participants, mostly who were, who were male. Um, this is a traditionally patriarchal uh, community. So it kind of, uh, you know, the men have to sign off on something before, um, you know, the whole family can actually take it up. So uh, we do understand that. Uh, so uh, they were really excited uh, at the prospect of working with a university and TSU because, I mean, they do associate, uh, you know, uh, an institution of higher learning with, you know, kind of credibility. And uh, so it was uh, really exciting for them. And we had to kind of clarify to them that we're not doctors, uh, we're not health practitioners, but we're just, you know, we're not nutritionists. We're just here as uh, educators. Uh, so just because they looked to us uh, as, you know, we're doctors and they had all these problems, can we help them solve them? Um, and then, so we did find out that most of them uh, cook uh, at home or seven days a week. They um, uh, do not have, they do not eat fast food as, you know, it's not like a normal, it, actually eating out is not a, maybe uh, I want to say normal thing for them. Um, and then we also found out that the besides Sunday, which is the only, it's actually Sunday is the only day that the um, community, the, the families uh, meet together because uh, they do uh, shift jobs. So you have the parents uh, probably, uh, you know, husband working uh, in the night shift and then the women working during the day. So, um, and then, so we, during the focus group, we had to tell them and, you know, we just made it clear to them that our goal is to work together and we're not here to change your way of life, basically. Uh, we're not here to, to, to uh, impose uh, what you should or should not do, but we're here to work together. And this is what we have. Uh, this is what our program does. What part of our program do you want to adopt for yourselves? So it, just helping them to keep their cultural food and integrating uh, healthy American foods into their diets. Our next slide, please. So these are some of the setups that we will have. Um, so we're planning to use different cookbooks um, that are Afro-centered, uh, basically because we want the recipes to make sense to them and also uh, be a, a, a like kind of a, a, a conversation starter. So what did you use this in your country? Did, do you still use it here? Um, what, uh, you know, just because, so, so we can kind of have, um, relationship, build relationship uh, from this. Uh, so that's what the cookbooks will be using. And um, the pot that you can see on there the, with a blue lid, uh, is called a tajin. Um, so it's basically what they use, we is used to cook, but this is um, cast iron, of course, but uh, what they use back in Africa is um, clay pots. Uh, of course, we couldn't have that for the for our classes because I mean they're too fragile. Um, and then the baskets and the wooden cooking sticks. So basically, these are the things that, uh, and then you know, uh, the the fabric, the uh, tablecloth is uh kind of African is that actually African patterns, just so we can um make our classes feel kind of uh inclusive and they feel uh that you know they can relate to uh what we will be doing. Next slide, please. And that is our presentation. If you have any questions, uh, we would be glad to answer them. Thank you, Winnie. Anybody have any questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A yet. But I feel like every time I say that, something just pops up like a minute later. <laughs> Let's see, we give it a few more seconds. And if not, feel free to keep putting things in the Q and A and Winnie, I'm sure we'll stay on for um, a little while longer and be able to type answers as well. I wanna make sure we don't miss anything. 
Will copies be available of ATOH translations? Yes. Um, so once we are done with the translations, they will be available. Um, we're not sure where, <laughs> but yeah, they should be available uh, to use for everybody. And not a question, but somebody said very nice presentation. And I love the ideas of having cultural cooking tools and tablecloths, et cetera. And then can you speak further about the approach you have found successful when working with the refugee communities? For example, I have found success with storytelling. Um, so I yeah, storytelling is uh I wanna say is uh very uh is uh, I mean, the Africans, you know, uh, traditional African setups, that's the easiest way of, um, you know, working with them. But we have not yet started our classes yet. We are still um, in the pipeline. Hopefully we'll be starting them before uh, mid this year. Um, we're targeting to probably do it in May. So that, that would be a question maybe to answer <laughs> afterwards. Yes. And we'll have, there's two quick questions. So one said, is there any central repository of nutrition education for African refugees? Seems like your materials would be useful outside of Tennessee. Uh, we, I haven't seen any, um, uh, you know, uh, the central repository yet. And our materials will be available for free for anyone to use uh, the translated uh, versions of the curriculums. So we would be happy to share them once we are done uh, compiling them. And yes, Charmaine Phipps, you can, um, you can contact me directly. Uh, I think my email, I can put it in the chart. Yes, I think if you want to click type answer in that Q&A section and then you can just type it right there and you can put okay. your um, and you can put it there. All right. Uh, Charmaine, you can also send me your uh, email address if you want to. Thank you, Winnie. We'll go ahead and move on to the next um, presentation, which is the power of language. And if there are any other questions for Winnie, feel free to put them in the Q&A and she can type her answers from there. And I will have Courtney come on next. Hello. Uh, apologies. I'm having trouble with my video, but that's fine. As long as you can hear me, that's, a, that's all we really need. Um, my name is Courtney Slater, and I am a team lead for the Southwest region for USDA FNS in the Technology, Nutrition, and Integrity branch. Some of you may know me as a SNAP-Ed regional coordinator for the Southwest region and everyone else. I look forward to getting to know you a little more. The so next slide, please. Just a quick disclosure. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures. I do work for USDA, but my comments and opinions, of course, don't reflect um, anything coming out of there. So next slide. So very briefly, this is what we'll be talking about today. We'll be reviewing the importance of language and how we use it and then we'll spend a bit of time on the impact versus the intent of the language that we use and how we can change it. I just want to emphasize that this is not original research that I have completed. This is a review of the current research available. Next slide, please. So the importance of language. Language has power. It is our most powerful form of communication, and it can be used to help or to hurt, to lift, destroy, guide, Manipulate, it can be used for all sorts of things and every interaction that we has have has a lasting impact. And because we wield this authority, it has to be exercised with caution. We can think about things such as racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, as well as the intersection of these, the misogynoir, the trans misogynoir, and how those words and the language that we use affect every person we interact with. Next slide, please. So we use language for our verbal and written expression. We use them to develop observations based on the sensory information coming into us. We develop our thoughts based on conclusions or judgments that come from these observations and ideas based on that sensory information. We form our feelings and our emotions with verbal and written language. And then we can also use language 
to state our needs or request help or let people in general know those things that we require. Next slide, please. So this is one example of our use of language. And we're going to spend a couple slides just looking at the word obesity and the impact it has had on the American community. So a quick definition, as most of us already know, overweight and obesity are determined by body mass index or BMI. And recent CDC data does show that about 72% of Americans have a BMI of 25 or above. 25 is considered overweight and 30 and above is considered obese. So using this information, fat bodies are the most predominant body type in the US. And I know you can't see me because my camera is not working, but I can tell you, I identify as a fat dietitian. I am a white woman. And so there are some things that we can tell just by looking at people. And the body type that I have is representative of about 72% of people living in America. So in about 2003, the CDC first noted the obesity paradox, which is a demonstration that fatness is not necessarily equal to health. Through numerous studies conducted since that 2003 timeframe, this obesity paradox has been confirmed. So longevity studies have shown that weight loss is rarely maintained long-term. It's not impossible, but the majority of people who achieve weight loss are not able to maintain it over time. However, weight loss studies also show that the actions people do to lose weight rather than the actual weight loss can result in better outcomes. So this is in the changing of our habits, the increasing the fruits and vegetables and the fiber, increasing or changing activity. Those things that we do independent of whether our weight changes can help improve our health. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so a very quick uh, history of body mass index and obesity. So in 1835, BMI was developed, but it wasn't called BMI, it was called the Ketelet Index. And Ketelet was a mathematician who had no background in medicine. He specified that BMI or the Ketelet Index should not be used at an individual level, but rather to be used for statistical use at the population level. The other unfortunate fact that a lot of people miss was that Cadillac developed BMI or what would in the future be called BMI to demonstrate the health superiority of white Europeans. And that is unfortunate because we know majority, uh, excuse me, I don't wanna say the majority. We know a large population of the United States, the Europeans really, every country, every continent are not necessarily white. Next slide, please. So continuing on with this brief history, in 1929 to about 1972, Metropolitan Life Insurance used height and weight data from white men within 20% of their quote unquote ideal body weight to determine insurance premiums. In 1972, the Ketelet Index was renamed Body Mass Index after a, quote, landmark study found that it was able to detect obesity with about 50% accuracy. And they felt this was a better tool than the current insurance industry equations. In 1985, the NIH redefined obesity to be similar to that 20% of ideal body weight that Metropolitan Life was previously using. And they determined that a BMI of 28 or above was considered overweight. However, that didn't last long. In 1998, the NIH redefined obesity and overweight again, so that thin overweight became a BMI of 25 and above, and obesity, which had not previously been defined in BMI, then became a BMI of 30 and above. When we look at the diversity of the US, this is based on July of 2022 data from the United States Census Bureau. The United States is about 58.9% white, which means that more than 40% of the United States population is a non-white race or ethnicity. So the information that we've been using, whether it was Metropolitan Life Insurance, that 20% of ideal, the Ketelet Index, BMI, those were all based on white men. We know 50% of the population is, is male, 50% is female, and then we have 40, more than 40% of, um, of uh, races are non-white. 
oops. Um, we also want to think about when we conduct weight loss and health studies, it's important to be able to control for all potential factors that may affect weight. But when we think about those potential factors, there are some things we wonder, how do we control for? We can control for things like activity, to a degree, possibly stress. But can we control for genetics, for other comorbidities? To some degree, we can, um, we can control for food intake, maybe even medication, but we can't control for income, education, access to healthcare. These are all things that have an impact on weight and using BMI, obesity, and other um, potentially inadequate health-related words have an impact on these individuals. Next slide, please. So now we're moving on to the impact versus the intent of our words. So what happens as a result of the language that we use? Well, in 1998, as a result of the NIH shifting overweight and obesity, millions of people went from normal weight to overweight or from overweight to obese overnight. When we look at the history of the quote unquote obesity epidemic, it began or is said to have begun around this time. So the intent of changing that language was to improve the health of Americans by emphasizing the importance of weight management and disease prevention. Because we can only control certain risk factors, the focus of uh, changing and redefining these words was to um, focus on food, drink, and activity, the three things that we largely have control over. Uh, I shouldn't even say largely because we know people with low income don't always have control over what they are and are not able to purchase. But the impact, which is the important part of this factor, the impact of this is the incorrect belief now that people who are overweight or obese are lazy and self-indulgent. This led to a large introduction of weight bias in medicine and society, and it led to the stigmatizing of those in fat bodies through shame and blame. So a study published in 2010 by the American Journal of Public Health showed that over the previous 10 years, so from about 2000 to 2010, there was a 66% increase in weight stigma and weight bias in the United States. A 2022 meta-analysis of, of um, weight bias and weight stigma studies showed that this is a pervasive thought process and it continues to increase over time. However, other studies have shown that overweight adults actually have some of the lowest mortality weights, again, emphasizing that weight or fatness is not necessarily equal to health. But this also forces us to consider weight bias and where it exists. So think about your own thoughts. Consider your own thoughts when you see a fat person. Think about your own thoughts and desire to lose weight or to achieve that um, the ideal body shape or size. Consider the fear people have of developing diabetes, which is commonly associated with obesity. Think about the fat jokes, the diabetes jokes, how bad guys in media are always fat, or how undesirable or undateable or, quote, ugly people in media are portrayed as fat. We body shame people we don't like, and we constantly make fun of fat people at gyms, when they're eating, when they go to the doctor, simply existing and doing normal things as a fat person is a reason to be mocked. Next slide, please. So as we're considering the impact versus the intent, we want to remember the intent of our words does not matter. It is the impact that they have. We can have all the good intentions we want, but what is important is what happens as a result of those words that we say. So because obesity and diabetes are so closely thought to be intertwined, even though only about 30% of the United States has some form of diabetes, whereas 72% of the United States is considered overweight or obese, these are very closely intertwined together. People with diabetes are two to three times more likely to develop a mental illness. And up to 42% of people with diabetes exhibit eating disorder behaviors. This does also include people who develop type 1 DE, which is a type 1 diabetes um, disordered eating called diabolemia, which is 
the skipping of insulin in order to go into ketoacidosis and force weight loss. Over 26% of people with diabetes think about suicide, with 12% of people with diabetes attempting suicide in their lifetime. For those people who don't know me, um, I have lived with diabetes since 1989. So I have had diabetes for a very long time. Unfortunately, 2005 to 2006 were very, very rough years in my life. Some of those diabetes and obesity related, and I attempted suicide four times in those years. So I am unfortunately part of these statistics. In addition, people in fat bodies have a 55% greater chance of mental illness. Fat people are demonstrated to have poorer health outcomes, partially because they have less access to quality health care, and also because they experience weight bias from their healthcare professionals. So how does this all relate to SNAP-Ed? This is where we want to focus on the moving away from personal responsibility that we place so heavily on weight and move more towards the changing of those PSEs, the policies, systems, and environments to address those community needs. Now, it doesn't mean nutrition or physical activity education is bad. Of course not. We know the positive benefits of those things. But it means that a combination of behavior education as well as PSE work are necessary to create those positive and sustainable changes because there are consequences to stigma related to weight. Next slide, please. So how do we change our language? Over time, language naturally changes. We think about slang and how we use it. Used to be popular to say things such as, um, you're a square, if we were saying someone was uncool. We also think about how language has evolved from using the word handicapped to disabled. Um, and language has evolved in many ways. So think about considering the potential impact of your conversations, independent of your intent. What is the impact of the words you use and how you discuss things with the people that you're working with? Ask yourselves, am I contributing to shame or blame or stigma related to weight, related to diabetes, related to chronic illness, related to um, low income populations using quote unquote welfare or um, entitlement programs? Make sure you apologize for the impact of your words, even if your intent was pure. So as I said earlier, the intent does not matter if the impact was negative and be willing to apologize when the impact causes harm, even if it wasn't your intent. Also be willing to acknowledge your own biases, actively seek to correct them and change them and question, do I know the whole story? Is there something being left out or did I miss something? And listen, listen to those who are expressing hurt. It's okay to say, I don't know. That is a sufficient answer. We don't have to have a response for everything right away. And that can sometimes be where we get in trouble. We want to be thoughtful before engaging and working with other people. And don't trust blindly that information is always correct, especially, and I know we know this, but especially language and things that we read on the internet. Do your own research. Ensure that you are trying to find the truth that is in these words. If there is truth, and if there isn't, try to find positive ways to spin that conversation or to work facts and figures into that conversation. So ask yourself these questions when you are having conversations. Does my language contribute to weight stigma or bias? Do my own initial ju judgments of an individual contribute to body or fat shaming? Think about your own thoughts. Are you body shaming yourself? And what changes can you make to help reduce stigma for your SNAP-Ed participants and the populations that you work with? Be thoughtful. Thoughtfulness and listening are some of the two most valuable skills we have that we don't ever think about honing and developing. Next slide, please. So this is where I leave you, this is the end, but I wanna point out this quote from Maya Angelou, 
where she says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that is where the impact of our words versus the intent of, of what's behind them matters. So I thank you very much for your time and for taking a moment to listen and learn along with me. And if there are any questions, I am more than happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Courtney. That was incredible. That was great. Let me see. Um, somebody did ask for your email. Her email's here and we'll put it in the chat. And we will be posting um, the recording and the slides on the ASNA website um, by the end of this month. So the recording will be available soon. And then just general like comments saying, thank you very much for this important presentation, very powerful. Um, and someone said, somebody provided feedback. As noted in your presentation, obesity is a serious chronic disease of adults and children. Consider introducing obesity as a disease. More importantly, importantly, consider avoiding the word obese in your narrative and presentations when referring to a person with this disease. For example, use people with obesity instead of obese people. So just some constructive criticism. Yes, Susanna, that is an excellent point. Um, and that is essentially the entire crux of the presentation. And you're correct. Uh, avoiding the use of the words obesity or obese. And unfortunately for this presentation, I felt like I had to use it to kind of emphasize the power and the impact of our language. But thank you, because you are 100% thinking on the correct track. Um, and what PSEs would you recommend to address these concerns? You know, Tony, that's an excellent question. And this is going to vary based on the community that you are working in and what their specific needs are. But again, it doesn't mean that we can't provide that nutrition and physical activity education. It means that it's important to not only give that information, but to also combine it with trying to find policy system and environment changes that work with the needs of that community. I feel like I can't give a, a flat or general answer to that only because where you're working is probably very different from the communities that I am working in. And so I don't want to um, provide information or feedback that is not necessarily helpful to those SNAP-Ed participants. But uh, the more we work together to try to find these ideas and develop what's important to them, the more we'll be able to change the tide. And I am going to skip down because there is one that I, a question here that actually piqued my interest as well. But with this in mind, has FNS ever considered leaving out obesity prevention in the snap ed definition? I'm so glad you asked that. And I hope the, the people of import are listening. Um, I'm working on that. It is a slow process, but we bring up at every opportunity we can how USDA and, and government guidelines potentially have an impact on uh, stigma and weight bias as well. And so um, I can't say that from my position, I can make those changes, but from my position, I can be very loud about it. And I'm not known for being quiet. <laughs> so I can tell you we're working on it. We love that energy. <laughs> um, and there are two more questions, but in the essence of time, I want to make sure that we are able to get a good break. Courtney, that was an incredible presentation and I truly thank, thank you. you. Um, do you mind just responding, typing through with the other two questions that are in the Q&A? Sure, no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. And here are some additional resources that Courtney had as well. Like we said, the recording will be um, posted on the um, ASNA webpage. So I will move over to Weight Stigma, stigma 2.0, moving from theory to practice. This is our last one before our break. And I believe it's Jennifer Ward. It is. So hand it over to her. Thank you. That is me. I am uh, recovering from a major surgery last week. So I'm going to stay off camera because I am in my recovery bed right now. And so you don't want to see me, see me here. But um, I 
am so glad to go after Courtney because this really um, dovetails nicely with what um, with that, with what I'm presenting about. A lot of you, if you were at ASNA in DC, I was able to present with Dr. Karen Frank um, on our work investigating weight as a motivator or a barrier to participating in nutrition education. And we found that when we, when we contracted with the market research firm, they were really reticent to even ask the questions. They said, people aren't gonna talk about it, which we thought um, exemplified how loaded weight is in our communities and our culture. And, the, the crux of this talk is that the, the stigma associated with weight will impact our nutrition interventions. And the idea of disentangling weight from health is extremely important if we're going to be impactful. Um, next slide, please. So there's a little bit of background. Um, I wanted to talk first about our bias inherent in nutrition education and when we use the obesity prevention frame. And I do want to push back a little bit on the idea of obesity as a disease. I think obese is a descriptor as Courtney uh, so beautifully laid out about the history of the BMI. In fact, you did a lot of my work for me. So I'm excited to be able to fit within my 10 minute time frame. Um, that the the history of the BMI is is rife with um, really racist and sexist kind of science, and it was never intended to be part of an individual diagnosis, but more of a population level descriptor. And so, the way we use obese is to describe a certain BMI level, and that may or may not have anything to do with an individual level health. And in fact, we know from the research that weight is um, can be related to health in other ways. In fact, you're 10% or you're clinically more at risk, 10% underweight than 10% overweight. And I always say that twice because I think it takes a bit of unlearning for people. It's a bit of a mind shift. So you're more clinically at risk, 10% underweight than 10% overweight. In fact, large scale NIH studies have found that people that are in that, um, just in the little higher end of the bell curve on, on the weight um, statistics actually have better health outcomes. And so we're not talking about the extremes of the bell curve, but right, right around the middle and a little bit overweight actually have better health outcomes than um, people normal or underweight. And those are those, that's the terminology used in the science literature. So when we have snap ed, we have obesity prevention in the name and it will take a literal act of Congress as I've found out to change that. So what can we do to mitigate weight stigma in our spheres of influence and what we do. Next slide, please. So there's potential for harm uh, in what we do. Uh, what we're trying to do is help people eat uh, more nutritious foods and have better access and to move more and to move well. Um, but because we're in the space, we are um, we're going to be interacting with weight stigma more. And so there's potential for harm at the participant level. So in classes where, um, you know, negative statements are made about weight, um, there's potential for harm. Uh, when we focus on weight rather than the quality of meals and the ability to move, we have are focused on the wrong goal. And then we also have harm for our educators, for the people in our programs. And when I've done these talks around the country and I've been to Minnesota and I was able to present virtually for Wisconsin, hi Midwest, if you're here, um, I found that a lot of people were saying, you know, I, I have felt harmed by the language in our SNEPED framework and our SNEPED work myself as a participant and people talked about feeling um oh I'm losing the word and I didn't even take my pain medicine today so I would be I would be on it but um 
they felt hypocritical uh, about being a fat dietitian or a fat nutrition educator. And that dissonance is carried through, but it is also silent. And I don't know about you, but in Tennessee, it's been silent for a long time. And so what we've been doing is, is training and, and talking about this and bringing it to light so that we can take care of our educators and the people in our programs. And then our impact. So we have the potential to not have as much impact as we could have when we have the focus around obesity and language around weight. And even at, you know, as the SNPA director for Tennessee, for the University of Tennessee, um, I do not use obesity prevention in my language or my talks, but it's there. And when people think about nutrition, they think about weight uh, more automatically. And that's, I think, a very cultural thing. Um, we have the potential to deter people from participating in our programs. They might think, oh, I've tried to lose weight. I can't do that. Or, you know, I can't eat healthy or all the things that we've heard before, but that's not the goal. Right. And so when I've done county visits or talked to an educator, and even though I don't use weight loss or obesity prevention in, in my talks and training, our educator in a county very close to my own said, oh, I have a great success story. One of my participants lost 40 pounds. And I was like, that's, that's not the success we're looking for because again, weight does not equal health. Weight loss may, may reflect a healthy change and it also may not. Um, a, like Courtney, thank you for sharing your vulnerability. I've had um, an eating disordered history myself. Um, I used to be very, very small. And when I was very, very small, I was very, very sad. And a lot of people complimented me for the way that I looked at that point, I don't look like that anymore, but, and, and it was really reflecting a negative health, a negative mental health thing going on with me at that time and in a negative life situation. And so losing 40 pounds is not a success story. And I really, um, appreciate the work and the synergy moving us towards that next slide, please. So in order to prevent harm, what do we do about that? We want to prevent harm for our participants, our educators, and we want to have the most impact that we can. Um, I think we need to disrupt the bias to behavior link. So bias does not always mean behavior. Um, having biased thoughts uh, or ideas or anything like that usually means you're just paying attention and that you've been socialized in a certain culture but you can disrupt the link between bias to behavior. You can have a weight bias. You can be a part of this culture that values and prioritizes thinness and disrupt the behavior that would reflect that. And in order to do that, I think we do need to, to engage in training um, and awareness. Uh, we need to bring these ideas to light and to spread it around. And this is kind of, this is like a table turning moment, I think for snap ed. Um, and the more awareness we have when we disentangle weight from health, when we talk about weight stigma explicitly, when we throw out obesity prevention at the ground level, then we're disrupting those things. We're creating more awareness. And I think we also, like Courtney stated, be reflexive about our own biases, about what we think, about our own experiences with weight. I am coming to you as a straight size white woman from the Southern United States with an eating disordered past who has been 130 pounds and who has been 210 pounds. Um, I have to reflect a lot on my feelings and my complicated history with weight when I engage in this work. And then we can also, in our spheres of influence, change materials and change language. Please don't delete obesity prevention from your slides when you're giving presentations out and about or when you're talking to stakeholders. We don't have to emphasize that part of the program. It's on the RFA, but we don't have we don't have to say it. Um, change your materials. You know, we've been reviewing our materials in Tennessee and we, I found a magnet that we were sending out to all the counties and, you know, giving out at health fairs and things like that. And as, as a recruitment tool, and we had weight management on the mag on the magnet as a positive, you know, result of attending our classes. And I let's, we're going to scrap that. 
redesign and send and some send something else out. Be sure that in our recruitment and our curricular materials that we are not using disembodied, um, you know, headless pictures of fat people. That's something that happens a lot in the news media. Um, and it is, it is not kind and it's not right. And it is a reflection of weight stigma and bias in our culture and society. Um, we should be using diverse bodies and people in our recruitment and our curricula. And I think a lot of, a lot of our materials could use an overhaul. So in your sphere of influence, we can do that. And you, we can also provide training, um, really from the ground up. Next slide, please. So when I've done these trainings around the US, um, what I've heard is I feel so seen. I, I did a first talk in Tennessee at our FCS professional development conference. And it just felt like the room, it was like tense at first. And then there was this collective exhale, like, wow. It's validating experiences. It's changing our interactions between, within ourselves, um, with our participants. We're creating a positive discourse around food and activity. It's important to eat yummy food that feels good for the place that we're in. And I always tell this story about when, when my fiance leaves, she always cooks. I'm not, I'm not the chef in the house. And when my fiance leaves town and my kids are with their dad, I just walk around and eat cheese from Costco because that's what nourishes me in the moment. And that's okay. That's not my normal everyday meal, but my Costco cheese tray is, is kind of a classic story now. Um, and, and that's what happens, but, you know, having this broader picture of what is healthy and what are the ways of, of knowing and feeling good about nutrition and physical activity. We also prevent harm. You know, we, when we are going into schools with adolescents who are at a particularly vulnerable space, especially around uh, weight and eating, we need to be cognizant of these issues and to use trauma-informed language and to avoid talking about, not, not delete the conversation, but avoid talking about weight loss as a goal um, and talking about health more holistically. And then in doing this, we increase our valuable impact in our programming. Next slide, please. So I know I'm at the end. Um, it's drjenniferward.com. It doesn't have the extra dot in there. That is my mistake. This is my email. You can contact me. Um, and, you know, I'm happy. I do these trainings around. Um, I'm happy to come and talk to um, educators. Normally, um, I will, you know, I can lecture on theory and we could talk about the, the frameworks about stigma and things like that. And also just what do we do in real life? So again, it's drjenniferward.com, not without the extra dot. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And Dr. Ward, I'll be sure to fix that before we post it to the Thank you. Yeah, page. You're cool. welcome. Yeah. I'll make a, I'll that make a note. Too. It happens. Um, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions? I don't see anything yet, but just give it a minute. Usually they come, they come in. And also, I know that this was our last presentation um, for our break. We are going to take just a quick break after this. Um, we'll be back at 1.30. Um, and we only have two presentations after that. We will be done by 2 p.m. So if you need a quick bathroom break or um, go get a snack or fill up your water, which is what I'm going to have to go do because I'm out of water, um, feel free. I don't see any questions. So if anything pops up, feel free to put them in the Q&A um, and Dr. Ward will be able to answer those. But with that being said, we will go ahead and we will be back at 1.30. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. We appreciate you.